Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back to your computer screen. Um, my name is Adam Greenfield. I'm the artistic director of Playwrights Horizons, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all uh, to this evening's Lighthouse talk. Um, the Lighthouse project is something that we launched during this very irregular season. Um, we named it after a lighthouse's reliable guidance through dark and stormy times. And it's designed to use our spaces in new and surprising ways to ask us to see the event of live theater, the physical, physical object of a theater, um, the writing of theater, and our engagement with theater through a constantly renewed lens. Um, in January, we launched a public art series in collaboration with two terrific artists, um, the legendary propagandist Avram Finkelstein and the equally legendary set and costume designer David Zinn. Uh, Avram and David contacted me hoping uh, to team up and activate the front of our dormant theater through public works. We began with a new piece by subway and street artist Jilly Ballistic. Uh, it was entitled With Great Power Comes No Accountability. And earlier this week we opened our second installation. It's two images from artist Ken Gonzalez Day's Profiled series which we are gathered online today to dive into some conversation over, accompanied by a trio of extraordinary artists. Um, this piece will be available for you to see live and in person through the first week of April, uh, when we'll open our next and uh, third installation in the series, uh, which will be two works by artist Dred Scott. All of this, of course, is on the front of our building at 416 West 42nd Street, in Hell's Kitchen, New York. Um, Playwrights Horizons is grateful that we have a building at uh, that address. Um, it's a building that's become a home for us and for the work that we believe in. Uh, but at the same time, we acknowledge that our building, our theater, is located on the island of Manhattan, which is situated on land that is Lenape Hoking, homeland of the Lenape. Playwrights Horizons pays respects to the Lenape peoples, Lenape elders, and their ancestors, past, present, and future. Also, as our theater's work and community extends beyond this island, we acknowledge that the Northeast is the homeland of many indigenous nations. Playwrights Horizons pays respect to all indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and to their ongoing contributions, culturally, intellectually, artistically, and spiritually. Um, to lead tonight's conversation, I'm delighted to introduce our Associate Artistic Director, Natasha Sinha. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for joining us. And Natasha, I will uh, pass the mic over to you and your excellent panel. Thanks, Adam. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you, Adam, for, for rooting us in this space tonight. I'm so, so thrilled for these next intros because this panel is made up of some very, very insightful and like just really exciting artists. So Ken, Liliana, Clint, can you come on stage now, please? Uh, and to remind you audience about who these brilliant folks are, um, Liliana Blaine Cruz is a director from New York City and Miami. Some recent projects include Anatomy of a Suicide at The Atlantic, Befu and Her Friends at Theater for a New Audience, and Mary Sequel at LCT3 at Lincoln Center Theater, which won her the Obie Award and which will we might talk about a little bit later today. Uh, Liliana is currently the resident director of Lincoln Center Theater. Clint Ramos is a designer, activ activist, educator, and creative producer. He won a Tony Award for best costume design of a play for Eclipsed, which made him the first person of color to win that category. He's currently a double Tony nominee for his scenic design for Slave Play and his costume design for The Rose Tattoo. And he has designed sets and costumes sets and or costumes for over 200 shows, theater, opera, and dance, including Booty Candy here at Playwrights Horizons that you might have seen. Yes. Finally, I wanna introduce you all to an incredible visual artist whose work is up on the building itself at Playwrights Horizons as of this week, as Adam was saying, and whose work is at the center of our talk today. Ken Gonzalez Day is a Los Angeles-based artist exploring the historical construction of race and the limits of representational systems. His erase lynching theories dealt with racialized violence in the US and helped to ground anti-immigration and collective acts of violence within the larger discussion of racial formation, policing, and racial justice movements. Um, and then works from the Profiled series, some of which is, is up in our building, have been shown internationally and grew out of research into the history of racial depiction in places like museums. 
So really a powerful group of artists here. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot of things or at least what we can in the time we've got. These Lighthouse conversations are ones that we really hope will spark something in your mind, making you you know, think of things at maybe a different angle than you have before when you next encounter art or just live in the world. Um, and I also just wanna shout out Abram Finkelstein and David Zinn who so thoughtfully brought forth Ken's work and a lot of the ideas for our public art series. So thank you, Abram and David. Um, so a lot of today's conversation will revolve around the macro assumptions that are sort of developed over time in a culture based on decisions made about what gets uplifted. So whether that means what art to display or how to display them in a museum, um, what you know plays to produce, how to produce them. There are huge effects on that, that curation can have on, uh, on a culture over time. So the ways of valuing one piece over another often stems from who's deciding and since those in power are often from these dominant communities, the generative act of curation is, is really worth digging into. So Ken, to start us off and to root us in your work this evening, can you tell us about how you made your profile series and what felt important along the way? Um, and, and also since it's been shown both as public art and also as part of museum displays, uh, just curious if responses change depending on context. First off, thank you for having me, and I'm so honored to be here with both Clint and uh, uh, Linnea um, and Natasha. Of course, welcome. I guess I've heard you're new or relatively new in terms of the theater, and so I think uh, what a wonderful opportunity to get to think about all of the different voices and all of the different ways that we that we come together here today. Um, I wish I was there. I live in LA, and for those that may not know, and so I have not seen the installation, but I. I look forward to seeing documentation of it and learning how it goes over. Uh, and I would just say also that there's a one piece that's basically, they have been shown in some version uh, before. And so we made a new version, which will have a, a text element that will be a, a short video in one of the windows. So if you happen to go by, and we spent a long time thinking about how language would fit into the representation and how to represent in language, the images that we're talking about. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. So I just wanted to just lay that as a framework for sort of how we're starting. I do have a series of images I could share, but we don't have to necessarily do that. But I think it might be helpful to look at a few things quickly. Um, I don't want to make it into a, you know, an art history lecture. And then to your question of the public versus the private displays, right? This idea of, is that, was that part of the question? So the uh, images have been displayed as billboards and uh, they've also been displayed in museums and galleries. And, and part of the reason for doing billboards and exterior works was basically to go into these museums and to find objects that had been forgotten, overlooked, um, disregarded, somehow uh, gone unseen in the institutions that we frequent and to photograph those and to bring them out of the museum and put them literally in the street where they could then sort of create a larger dialogue. And the groupings were based around notions of race and racial formation as represented in objects that exist in museums today, right? So that's sort of the beginnings of the, the argument. And really it started uh, when I was a, a, a scholar, a visiting scholar at the Getty Museum, where I would see these kids running past these depictions of, of uh, you know, basically an African slave, the Harwood sculpture and not even looking at it and just watching them run past and thinking, you know, I don't need to make a new sculpture. What can we do to give this sculpture a voice? What can we do to change the way people see these objects and, and to try to re-engage with them and to try to see them in, in different ways? Not, and so to go back and look at the, the, yes, how they came to be there, how they were named, how they're identified, how they're not identified. And of course there is an overlap with the Mary C. Cole as well, which we'll get to. <laughs> uh, is that a good enough talk about, you know, what, like how, how you put profile together really. Um, and just tell us a little bit so that, you know, for the folks who haven't yet been able to come by and see it. Okay. I'm going to look at the clock right now and we're going to do this. In, <laughs> so I, I, you, I know you, not everybody knows me, but I, I can be chatty. So I'm going to try to resist my, my inner self and go quickly. Don't so. resist it. I'm excited about this. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to come back too. And you guys can interrupt as, as we are looking. Don't think like we don't see you. You're still here. 
feel free to ask Ken, what's that about? Or why did you do that? Or that's messed up or uh, explain that. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and see the first one. And I only have nine, I'll just warn people ahead. So it's not gonna, not a whole lot of stuff. Uh, so part of where the whole project began was this idea of what is a profile and when did when did the, 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 the practice of profiling people, whether that's racial or otherwise happen, right? And so um, this is a drawing uh, etching from uh, Lava Terre's uh, physiognomy book published in the 18th century. And basically he had this instructions for how to build a sure and convenient machine for making silhouettes, which is what is shown there. And it's showing a woman in the chair with a candle and then the guy on the opposite side make, drawing the profile. And you guys have all seen these black silhouette profiles uh, from the 19th century. And, and so I was sort of thinking about where all that comes from. On the next to it, I actually made the chair that he as following his instructions to see how it worked and to see what, what you get out of it. Like, does it really create an image that looks like a profile? Is it just a blurry thing? If you think about when you, uh, the shadow from a candle is typically uh, blurry. So anyway, that was the beginning of thinking about how this form came to be his particular use of it was was for character analysis and for the sort of what we now think of as a pseudoscience. Let's go to the next one. And so that's 18th century, 19th century. We really get these ideas of beauty, of of perfection, right, of racial purity beginning to to uh, be represented in objects. So here you see four images of women, uh, two from the Getty Collection, two from the Field Museum. The first one is a kind of 19th century um upper class you know new york woman actually or it's from the the original in a new york uh the new york historical society in the background is the venus um again a uh, a later version but you see the sort of idealized female beauty and notions of whiteness on the one side on the opposite side two sculptures from alvina hoffman from the 1930s <clears throat> one of a japanese woman one of a native american woman you can see just from looking at them that uh, the, the treatment of the figure is different, right? The, the treatment of the characteristics, the, the rendering of the skin, the rendering of the hair, and, uh, of, and they are also made in plasters. They were, they were meant to sort of not given the kind of same uh, value as the ones in marble. Uh, so that sort of, this, this piece sort of thinks about beauty, female beauty and how it's constructed around uh, issues of whiteness and how that was represented and is still represented. These are all still in museums today, all still seen by young girls and young boys going to museums. And so how do we take these things and, and rethink their, their legacies and their messages? Uh, next image. This is all uh, just a, a, a shot in a, from a storage facility of Malvina Hoffman's sculptures. Uh, she was commissioned in 1930, the largest commission ever received by a woman artist at that time in, in the United States um, to sculpt the 104 races of the world. That's right, the 104 races of the world. Uh, as you may know, we do not have 104 races. So this was part of uh, the sort of eugenics movement that was really came out of America and eventually went to Germany and became the basis, right, and formed the Holocaust and, and a whole bunch of other atrocities. So I wanted to go back and look at these sort of formative moments and thinking about how race was depicted. And then we'll just go quickly to the next one. Uh, this is one of the images that is in the window. Not this is the billboard version of it, but uh, a version of this is in the window at the theater. So you guys can go see the, the installation there. This particular one was, uh, these two are from the Getty Museum. There's basically a, a Italian Renaissance sculpture on the left, what would be the left. And this uh, uh, Harwood image that is now believed to be a slave or ex-slave. Uh, from uh, England, London. And um, they're both believed to be portraits. So they're not just generic types, they're actual people and their names have been lost, right? So I, I put them together in, in LA um, as a way of thinking about race and racial representation. They both appear to be black, but of course they are not. And this idea that of, of how race signifies uh, in a different city. And also it was constructed uh, after in California, we had this thing called Proposition 8, which banned gay marriage. Uh, in And basically those, the case was being tried 
and the Supreme Court eventually overturned it and allowed gay marriage four months after this billboard came down. So just to give you a context, so I was thinking both about race and racial depiction, what signifies race. And then I was also thinking about what is the, what is the dynamic? So these are two existing sculptures that I simply photographed, but in trying to create a dynamic between them, right? To the, how they see, seem to see each other, what are the implications? Is it contra, confrontational? Is it romantic? Is it ambivalent? How do we, how do we imagine, how do we man, imagine mitigating these multiple threats, right? The sort of intersectionality that, that informs all of us. None of us are one thing alone. Uh, anyway, we can talk more about that in a minute in the next one. Sorry. I think what's also really interesting about that, Ken, is like, you know, you're putting you're putting different pieces next to one another, which is also speaking about how museums display work as well and what that means, right? So I love seeing these pictures and sort of moving towards those ideas. Um, yes, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we could also stop there and just talk if you want to, or, or I can try to do it in two minutes more. <laughs> Okay. What do you want, Liliana? Two minutes more, two minutes more. I want to okay. see you here. <laughs> so here you see, then I basically took that principle and traveled to a bunch of different museums. This represents work in 22 different museums in, in four different continents. And basically looking at all of the ways race has been depicted. And next image is a close up just so you can see a little better. And each one has a story, of course. There's the first mannequin uh, in France. There's images from ancient Greece of uh, of Africans, there are uh, Native Americans, there is at least one Latino, very hard to find. You know, the, the subtext for all my project could be, where's the Mexican, in the sense that it's very hard to find Latino representations in general in museums and certainly in sculpture. So it's called 41 Objects Arranged by Color, and clearly it's based on the, the color they were painted and not, or rendered and not the color of the actual bodies, right? And thinking about that race as a kind of arbitrary signifier. And then uh, the next one. Uh, so at the Smithsonian, I had the opportunity to do a, a large exhibition. And so I, at the National Portrait Gallery, which normally basically houses the images you see on the left, which is Lincoln, Washington, uh, you know, other sort of famous, you know, Duchamp, basically famous white guys. Uh, and then in the back, I have a sculpture of America with her back turned to us. Uh, which was an incomplete or uncommissioned uh, proposal. And then on the right are three uh, Native American busts that I found in basically in a storage facility in the National Museum of Natural History, photographed them and researched them to figure out who, who they were. And uh, eventually, I think, uh, next image. So I was trying to bring, uh, to think about who gets represented in our national museums? It is our national portrait gallery, right? And how do you get uh, included in that? And one of the things that they are concerned with is that you merit enough importance to be included. So this question of how do we go back and correct a history that never saw, you know, our contributions as being significant? And so, uh, in this, I just pulled this one up as one example just to show you. So the the. The plaster bust that was made is not something we would normally think of as a very beautiful object, right? It was it was on a display in what was the uh, uh, the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, and basically celebrating the the purchase of this land and the displacement of white indigenous people. You can see the original photograph, and it's it looks very easy to see it here, but but originally the sculpture was not connected to the photograph, and it took me uh, years to find that image of who the actual model was. And then you can see they changed his hairdo, so they added a feather, which of course the Pawnee did not wear. And uh, they misrepresented his name for the past 150 years. So he was referred to as Prairie Chicken, uh, but that was actually his wife's name. And he'd gone with his wife to the photo studio and all this time he'd been mis uh, misrecognized. So uh, we went back to the Pawnee and asked them, shared the image, shared the history we had found and asked them what his name would be or, or was. And in the end, the Pawnee language had shifted in a way that there couldn't, they didn't have a clear consensus on what the naming convention would have been at the time. And so gifts to the poor is the name that they, they have uh, given to this historic figure. And we were able to put him on view in our National Portrait Gallery with his proper name for the first time ever. And so that was just to kind of round that out. And then the next one, oh, yeah. And then the last one is that the, the also in the, the window display at the theater, which is uh, these two images 
bust of African woman who was once known as Mary Seacole. And again, we'll probably talk about that in a minute. And then of course, on the opposite side, bust of Madame Adelaide Julie Merlon de Nouvelle. I, I, I apologize for my bad French, but you get the idea that one has a name and one doesn't, that they are both looking at each other. They have a great many similarities. They have both little cute button noses and dimples and double chins and curly hair. There's so many things that are similar about them. Why do we see them as so different? And so I was trying to think again about this idea of the arbitrariness of race and, and the, the way that race influences the way we see one another. And then just very quickly last thought that there's actually no race here, right? These are two pieces of rock and we bring race to the to conversation. So part of it is to say, not to villainize the fact that race is a historical construct, but to try to create a space in which we can see the distinction between the language that surrounds forms and, and the individuals that inhabit those uh, forms, I guess. And we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> your, your work like zooms in on so many larger ideas. That was, that was just like really incredible to hear you speak about like the choices that you made and like connecting some of those dots for us. You're just, you're saying so much by putting these pieces next to one another and prompting a lot of these questions and drawing our attention to them. Um, and, and in thinking about what Ken just shared about profiles and the, you know, sculptures of different races, um, Liliana and Clint, I'm just, I'm curious what you see of, of racial formation in our theater world, the way that Ken was talking about in uh, with these sculptures and with these photographs and just like the other ways that people have taken in these these art images and like how how that plays a part in your work as artists, as, dire as a director, as a designer um, and how that feeds into trying to tell truthful stories because it's, it feels like you would have to, you know, deal with the way different races are represented in theater and in all art forms uh, in these sort of charged channels. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> all the big questions. I mean, um, it's, it's complicated, right? And I think what's so amazing about, um, about your work, Ken, which is, I think, in some ways in relationship to theater is that it, impl it implicates the audience who is seeing it, right? As you're seeing, you are aware of how you're identifying what you're seeing. And in that identification, you are forced to question why you identify the way that you do and how you see the way that you do. So there's like a, there's a looking back in some ways as you, at least in my experience of looking, I'm like, oh, interesting. How am I reading? Like, these are, these are just, two sculptures, like I'm thinking of the billboard and I'm like, I'm putting a whole story, multiple stories on, on two images that happen to be like in construction in relationship to each other. And I think that's in some ways like the power um, and wonderful complication of theater is that those images move <laughs> and change and, and the, our relationship to them um, is in some ways in, in relationship to where we are, where it's happening, what our histories are, what our knowledge is, and what that means. Like, so take to take the example of a show like Mary Seacole, how many Americans really knew who Mary Seacole was? You know what I mean? And what does it mean that now she's making an appearance as a kind of ghost limbo figure in a theater? You know what I mean? How do we reconcile that image? How do we meet that image? And then how does that image get, um, um, uh, kind of broken apart in the myriad of Marys that she becomes over the course of the play. So for me like that, it's the, the, the manipulation and maneuvering of image that allows us to kind of push back against or be in relationship and conversation to audience expectations, which is what's fun for me. And to, to say a little more about Mary Seacole, just for folks who may not know that play, which is an incredible play by Jackie Sibylla's jury that Liliana directed at LCT3. Um, you know, this is a real figure in history, a British Jamaican nurse during the Crimean War. Um, and when we talk about wartime nurses, she's usually overshadowed by like Florence Nightingale, which that also says so much. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so what you're saying, Liliana, just feels really thematically, like that play feels thematically uh, connected to Ken's work and what you're what you're exploring here about perception. Um, Clint, were you going to say something? I feel like I cut you off. Hi, um, it's such a thrill to be 
you know, with with Ken, whose work is amazing, and Liliana, you know how I feel about your work. So I'm, I'm just so honored. And also, Natasha, congrats on the new gig. Um, so uh, I, you know, I what I love about like when when I started seeing the uh, Ken's work was. Um, baby, I'm sorry. Yes. It dried out. Oh, we love a cameo. Yes, babe, I'm gonna talk. <laughs> <laughs> Just made my day in so many ways. You don't even understand. We've been, um, yeah, no, we've been exploring death through flowers. Um, but like, what? I, sorry. But I, what I was, what I, what I was going to say was that I think one of the things that really fascinated me about your work is that it made me examine how we actually act. Um, you know, I, I, I love not only sort of this examination of like, how do we see race, right, but like actually how we arrange it. And, and a lot of like what I feel that's happening in the theater right now, sort of in the macro level actually, and in the in the sort of you know in while we're working in the play is is what you you know what you're dealing with, which is valuation, right? Like how do we attach to the arrangement of quote unquote races is also an attachment of valuation and and, and uh, or, or an examination of valuation. So a lot of like the the things that I you know that I'm looking at your work makes me really think about like how we're creating um how we're putting value into into works and how we're locating ourselves uh, in proximity to what we think is valuable, you know, and how we actually prioritize what we work on because, oh, this is what what we think is valuable. Even the sort of like the most quote unquote like woke practitioners are, you know, placing value in something that is again like imaginary and constructed and I, and i'm fascinated by that and i think a lot of like your work actually you know pokes at that bear yeah i mean i was gonna, just going to say that they are also staged which one of the reasons why i was really interested in doing it at this location you know at a theater is because uh you know they're there's they're they're literally staged you know like there's there's and, and I've shot actually, I did a series of portraits where I had people looking at each other and sort of trying to do the same thing. And it didn't work the same way as the sculptures because the sculptures was so much about us. We know that we're looking at them, right? So, so their agency is, they're rocks, right? <laughs> so their agency is implied, it's implicit, we feel it, we might empathize, but they don't actually have agency um, because they're inanimate. <laughs> and so uh, strategically, and also by placing the, taking the space. So when you think about the theater, how you build a mood or how you create this, communicate this idea, you guys do that through the costume and the lighting, through the timing. Do they come now? Do they come later? The sound, all these elements are gonna happen and you control all that. So the, the, your viewer is sitting there and you're, you're taking them on a ride and they're getting all the signals and hopefully they arrive where you want them to. For art, people are doing other things. They're on their phone, they're, you know, they're going to go get lunch, they, whatever. They're thinking about where they parked the car, they don't remember where they left it. Um, I think people do that in theater sometimes too, not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> but I was gonna say, that's trying to create a space that invited those kinds of critiques. I think I was in trying to almost in a way create a space that is theatrical and to think about uh, that experience, even though I wasn't, didn't verbalize it that way at the time, you know, but, uh, really been engaged by thinking about how we tell stories through time and through space. Yeah, but just my, go ahead. No, no, just thinking about staging, I'm still like, I, was, I had a very visceral upset feeling of your portrait of the um, the statues in storage with the, the tags yes. around the neck. I was like, well, this is very upsetting to me. Like the lack of agency and these tags around the neck. I'm just like, no. And I don't even know the context, but I was angry. I was so mad. I was like, that's so <laughs> powerful, the rage that I felt. Yeah, and to just like find out about sort of the history that that was an assignment to actually kind of like, you know, arrange people in 138 races. That was, that's fascinating to me. But what you just said actually is also, it, it reminds me 
of this thing that we, you know, that we've we've done in the theater, where where we kind of like assign again, like the it's like semiotic arrangement to literally convey, you know, a racial construct, right? And so, you know, um, yes, we're casting, like, you know, do we you, we cast a dark skinned person or we cast this person, but also what actually, how do we locate that that particular visage on stage to, to convey the positionality that we think is important to tell that story. And I, 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 that, that makes me think about the practices that we do to actually, I'm not ju judging our practices. I'm just saying that there's so much of this exercise that is so epigenetic almost in the theatrical practice, you know? It's so funny because one of my favorite shows that you've ever done, Clint, was Good Person of Szechuan, which I was like, how yes. do you do this? So complicated. <laughs> and it was so beautiful and complicated and amazing. And I was like, Clint, solve this. I don't know how, but Clint, solve this. And I'm okay with it. And Taylor Mac is amazing. And he makes sense. I know. And he's wearing a kimono. It's so long. <laughs> you know? Thank you for saying that. I just feel like I think it's most, I think it's most, um, how would I say this? It's in the sort of disruption of that arrangement that we, that we, that we, I mean, like what you're doing is like you're questioning the arrangement, right, Ken? And, and actually, Liliana, I'm going to like talk about the show that, um, uh, uh, um, that I love, um, and it was a signature, you know, and the way, and the way, um, uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the symbols kind of like really uh, locked the, the, the folks in their position. But like, for me, I think part of whatever success or whatever that rubric is, is really about, um, what excites me at least is the rearranging of the things, right? It's like, it's literally like, oh, okay. Then that, that to me feels so wrong because I, I think a lot of the programming is about the arrangement, right? It's about like the thing. And so when you put like Taylor, who is, you know, um, uh, uh, who is Taylor and you put him in something that feels like it wouldn't necessarily belong, right? And you put other people in the same thing and, and the arrangement becomes, um, it becomes dizzying, you know? And I feel like there's something like really magical about that, you know? Uh, like the moment you brought those, like, you know, that watermelon sequence um, and then, you know, the Egyptian, I'm like, I'm dead, I'm, I'm done. I am so- just, <laughs> just so folks know, Clint's talking about the death of the last <laughs> black man in the whole wide, in the whole entire world uh, by Susan Laurie Parks, which Liliana directed. And it was just so arrested, like visually arresting and just these sequences that, that yeah, put, put a lot uh, next to one another to sort of draw different conclusions and different um, sort of spur different thoughts. Uh, Liliana, I don't know if I cut you off there. Cool. Thank you for saying the whole title, by the way, because like I always just like say black man. You know, I stumbled. I, I got I got the entire and whole wrong. I do that every time with that play. <laughs> I love that play though. Um, but can I can I ask Ken a quick question? So please. Ken, you have access to so like it it like the the breadth of the materials that you have is so large you as an artist are now also choosing to select who you stage how do you go through that selection process and what pressure do you feel on yourself about who you choose to highlight the great question of course uh, uh, i think i have something like 22,000 photographs <laughs> wow because I mean, and I've only shown like ten or fifty, or because it's really complicated work, and it's really difficult to get opportunities to show it. <laughs> and like the Smithsonian, so that the the Smithsonian show was basically I proposed. Uh, so they don't just let anybody walk into these storage collections, and so I had to make a proposal, and often I do. <clears throat> and so I proposed to look at basically First Nation people in our in our nation's capital. That was my proposal, and to sort of look for all of the depictions of Native Americans that we had in the Smithsonian. That was kind of the, and so I went from the National Portrait Gallery to the American Art Museum, to Natural History. There's 22 museums at the Smithsonian. And then from that, I had to ask for permission to go into the storage facilities. And then I had to get, I had, you know, you know how a day is. Somebody, there's not people that let me in every single day. 
And so I had a, a very narrow window, plus it's quite far away from where I live. So basically all of those things determined that I had five hours today, four hours this day, and I had you know a couple of weeks to do it. And this is what I got. So the so I had researched online and then basically looked for anything that could be. In the case of the, the plasters, which you see, they've never been in, in the art museum side because they're they're sort of embarrassing in the in the art form itself. It's painted plaster. It, it looks like it should be like a, you know, almost like cigar, the cigar uh, Indians or whatever they were called, um, uh, the wooden ones that were carved and, and part of a display. And these were for displays about race and racial difference that were to educate the masses. And so bringing this stuff out, which in part we feel like they should be destroyed, right? They shouldn't exist. And maybe that's true, but in part, we, I, from my perspective, we don't want to forget our own history. And this is, of course, you guys know this in New York with the monuments and the question of what monuments stay and what do you do with them after? So I was basically working around that issue uh, when I was working on this project and thinking about how do we represent First Nations people and how do we, literally, those of us who are not uh, First Nations people represent these histories. So, um, so I, we went back and worked very closely to try to get back to the communities and to try to talk to descendants and to try to share the work because uh, some of the communities had not seen these images before either. They hadn't seen the sculptures. So um, so that's the first part. There's usually a premise and the premise is, becomes the part of a show to talk about representation of some issue. And then the selection is really uh, assisted by that process, right? They also have to kind of come out well and all of that. Um, the Mary Seacole, so the, the, the two women, the two white women originally was called uh, Mary, uh, bust of African woman after photographed by Mary Seacole. It turns out it wasn't. And that had been used apparently by the person selling it uh, to generate larger income <laughs> or to make it a collectible. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so the Getty, at, when I first photographed it, referred to it as bust of Mary Seacole and then has since altered it as they've learned that it wasn't or that there's not enough data to prove that. So in like in the profile book, it says Mary Seacole and because uh, that's what it said at the time. And now we know it's not. So all of these issues, right, are part of what part of the the work is not simply the photograph of the sculpture, right? Anybody could do that. Uh, the work, as far as what I do, the work is what happens after that. And so I think in part, I don't know what it's, I, I guess in a part I'm staging a conversation that never happens or only happens like here. Maybe this is where the work happens, right? Or, the, or when you're standing in front of it and you see it and you, you have a connection or it makes you angry or it makes you feel something, then the work is happening. Artwork that, you know, it's like the, the tree in the forest. Does it really exist if you don't? Uh, I, I feel like my understanding of art is that it is about the, the person who's looking at it and, and a dialogue. And to bring it back to the theater question, this idea of staging people, how do we know who the hero is? How do we know who the right? So you get you do this through lighting, through sound, through stage entrance and timing. All of these things tell the the viewer what they who these people are, right? And then we have dialogue and things that that uh, fill in the blanks. But you've already the stagecraft is literally to paint the picture for us, right? And that assumes that we have enough cultural uh, literacy to read the coding and then for you to subvert that coding. So maybe the question for you guys is how do you guys undermine, you both acknowledge the, the conventions and then undermine those conventions to create your own work? Yeah, that's the question. Cause I was looking at the <laughs> billboard and I was like, the hero is the black man on the right side. Cause he's on, if you're looking at it diagonally, you're like, right, he's the center. And the white dude is in the lost corner and he's the antagonist and look at the sharpness of his nose. It's crazy. It's crazy what theater makes you do and set up in your head and like how that, how that arranges itself. And like, it's funny in thinking about Mary Seacole, like the, the play starts with her, um, talking about who she is and she describes herself as a mulatto woman, but the actress we cast is nowhere near being a mulatto woman. And so already you have like a disjunction between like language and 
image. And so she's kind of standing on this pedestal, like this bust, right? Like she would in the museum. But like as her skirts move, you realize like she's got these pink sneakers on. So for me, like the the, the like subversion can kind of happen, as you've mentioned already, over over time or like with the arrival of new images and in, in relationship to the space. Yeah. I think what's also really interesting about this is that, um, you know, this the, the series that um, is holding this work right now at Planet Horizons is a public art series. So like the idea of anyone, of everyone just really engaging with it and uh, doing that work of, of, you know, thinking through what it means and what these images and sculptures and uh, curated displays are actually telling us is just is just really interesting. You know, it's totally free for any passerby to just engage with this thing. Um, and we wanted to lean towards like big ideas around justice and power and culture, which makes me think Clint, while you, I know while you were in the Philippines, you were like in the world of political street theater, um, you know, like a, ver a very public art that's pointed at like a specific passionate desire for, for a goal, right? But I'm curious at what point and maybe how you realize that theater and art yes, can be a catalyst for change, but can also intentionally or unintentionally perpetuate, you know, what actually needs to change simply by existing, like existing in that way still um, and not questioning the categories um, and not acknowledging how things are framed and who's framing. So I'm just curious, like how you feel about the experiences you've had with both street theater and like maybe in public art spaces, as well as like the opportunities and, you know, incredible parts of working on Broadway, off Broadway, uh, inside houses. That's so deep. That is the deepest question <laughs> I've gotten. Like, I'm, I, you know, I mean, I don't even know how to answer that question. Here's the thing. It's like, I feel like, yes, you know, my, my, my background is political street theater because that was just the zeitgeist in which I was like, I was, you know, I was, uh, um, I was introduced into, uh, into the theater by, that and so I, I actually didn't know that was sort of the point of departure and 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 the point uh, that is the point where I actually compare everything that I do against right and so I, I didn't know I wasn't um, when I when I when I, I was like twelve or thirteen when I, when we were protesting against the Marcuses right and so and and I was introduced by a drama teacher and he and he said come you know come to this thing that we're doing and, and you know and it was like you know it was like highly unusual because like first of all I'm like a child but also like you know it was off campus I was in a boarding school and my job was literally to hold this flag and then you know all of these like um we, we would do it around lunchtime and all of these like office workers would come and converge at the plaza right and we would perform these like um like short allegorical pieces like 10 mm -hmm. 12 minutes because the cops would come i mean the police would come with their water cannons right and would disperse it and you know so i i i, I knew that it was exciting i knew that that was what was what was happening and and i i, I only know um, of its efficacy in that sort of way, you know, in that kind of radical um, uh, flavor, you know. So, and I feel like I approach uh, a lot of. I've not lost that, and I, I and I approach a lot of theater making, um, you know, with the same sort of consumption and radicalism. You know what I mean? And uh, mm -hmm. um, and to varying degrees. And I think a lot of my despondency when it comes to the theater is when. Uh, the power that it holds doesn't live up to its potential. Um, thinking about what you said about like, um, when does it fail, right? Um, because it merely exists. Um, and I think that's a really deep question because I think we form, um, I, and, I, and I'm sure it's the same with the museum world or, you know, we form art making in the same way we form this nation and we form, uh, capitalistic structures, right? And and so I think it starts to erode when when it becomes about um, when when it becomes about an unexamined power dynamic, right? And so like it, there, we're always enamored by the old tours, right? We're always enamored by um, um, this sort of creator god, you know. And um, and 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 if you belong, like listen, I didn't know I was brown until I came to the United States. You know what I mean? Like I came here and all of a sudden, boom, I was brown. 
I was just gay and fat when I was like, <laughs> you know, when I was living there. All of a sudden, like now I'm, I'm like gay, chubby, and brown. But but what I'm saying is that like when when when, when I think when your when when uh, your 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 uh, your location of practice right mirrors the um the sort of the power dynamics of the macro things that in which you belong that's really when it starts to fail and it starts to eat itself you know and and i have to say that that's what's happening what has been happening to the american theater right and i think um and I, I, I'm not putting any blame on anybody. Everybody has some degree of complicity to that. But I think part of, I think what this time has given us is actually, you know, like very much like Ken's work, a chance to actually look at how we've arranged these things. A chance to actually say, hey, you know, like for instance, I just saw Liliana and Isa and Jackie started this group, right? Like I would have never thought that the idea that we need a space like this to actually nurture folks, right, is revolutionary to me. And that is an arrangement that, except that that is an arrangement, uh, particularly to nurture black women theater artists health. You know, that is an arrangement that we've never examined because we actually never thought that that was an arrangement that should be present. So I, I feel like a lot of the constructs is really um, it's it's uh, um, it's about dismantling that sort of like the auteur power dynamic that 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 God creator thing that really ultimately you know leads to oppression. I don't know if I answered your question. That was amazing, and that gave us so much. Thank you. I'm also just. I'm curious, have have you, Clint or Liliana, have you um, done other, have you had other public art performance experiences that, um, I'm curious how those may have functioned or how you may have felt about those as opposed to, you know, uh, a Broadway production, off-Broadway production. Um, but I don't know if you've been in those spaces as director, as designer. Or what do you think it could offer? It's su It's such an interesting, it's just so interesting to think of the the pros and cons and the like what things offer versus uh, considering like what space they're they're put in. Somewhat tangential. I um, was not. I was <laughs> side story. I didn't know I, where my path was was going to take me in theater. But right out of college, <laughs> I um, I did this internship. Um, in Santa Fe, where I worked in the public arts program, right? And I mm -hmm. and I had I spent a lot of time talking to visual artists about whether basically they'd be willing to put their art outside, right? And there was something about the 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 ask already, which was complicated. I had complicated feelings about asking people to do anything for free, even if it was for the city. But I realized that part of it was about accessibility, right? Who gets to see what? That the museum doors, the theater doors, the institutional doors in and of themselves keep people out or make people feel unwelcome, right? Or make people feel like that has nothing to do with them or their world. And that there's something about being outside and easily accessible or just on a storefront or through a window, you know what I mean? That suddenly makes it accessible to everyone. And I think that's another like big question that I think we're asking in this moment as these doors have been shut, which is like, how do we let people in? You know what I mean? Or how do we break out of what has been our containers? You know, like that's one of the questions I'm asking right now. I'm also just going to add, I think, like, just, you know, in, in when you ask about, like, this public spaces, I think that the last year actually has been all public in a way, you know, just through this, like, this, what we're doing right now and every single th encounter that we've had has mm -hmm. been kind of, like, more porous, you know, sort of, like, spiritually um, than anything that could, that has four walls, you know, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the public thing is very, very, um, I'm in spaces right now because, you know, as we know, they're starting to, you know, they're starting to open, they're starting to open stuff back up and or just talking about it. And I'm in these spaces where like they're actually thinking about, oh, wait, are we just going to leave that thing? And why is it feeling like we're actually going back inside? 
you know and 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 i and i and i kind of like i'm fascinated by that like are we like it feels like we are going back inside you know and it felt like we've been outside although we've been siloed here physically you know i think uh um yeah yeah that's a great thing to keep in mind of sort of you know what what have we figured out during this time and how do we translate that into what we'll be able to do at some point in the future, um, but without going backward, rather moving forward and moving a lot of these ideas forward. Um, I wanna make sure to get to some audience questions, but uh, but la lastly, I just wanted to ask, I'm curious if you, if any of you have thoughts about how to, how to celebrate difference rather than measuring it or cementing it into an understanding that's really only, you know, based within these dominant lenses. Uh, and yeah, I'm just I'm just curious if you have thoughts about also how to like undo what has already taken up residence in you know the visual art canon in the theater canon. Uh, what do you think we can do to um, uproot that? Well, I think we're all doing what we think we can do. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the sense that we are pushing, we are we are disciplined, meaning that we we all come from disciplines and working with that those disciplines. We know where we didn't fit in, right? I'm sure for all of us growing up, we didn't see people that look like us in the places that we are now and trying to think of ways to facilitate that and to extend that. So for me, the, those plaster sculptures, which if you'd asked me before I did the project or right, formally ugly or, or not art or something, right? Kitsch, all of these things and trying to find a way to switch them around and celebrate them for what they do represent and what they did capture. And, this was a person that lived 100 years ago and did uh, have an impact. And so from, from my perspective, art is a celebration, or if nothing else, it's a space, right? That, that invites people to come and consider. And there's days when I look at the things that I'm, I'm elated, and there's days when I think of, look at the things that I'm angry. And there's days when I look at the things and I, I think I should have done something different. But I think the idea of creating a space that invites these kinds of questions is something that I think we all share in our work and in our approach to it. But there's still beauty, there's still institution, there's still the structures that that hold it together. Um, that's my quick, short summary thought. Yeah, that's that's so real. I mean, the, the conversations that erupt out of all of your art, honestly, each of you as artists, um, feels like a step towards, you know, massive reconsideration and really making visible all the stuff that maybe hasn't been talked about before and therefore not really part of the the like soup of it. Right, as this does represent for you guys, right? The institution is now hosting a Zoom and not, you know, whatever, I don't know what you did before, but now this is or not a Zoom, sorry, a lighthouse, I'm not sure what the program is, but a, a uh, you know, a public format that's different. Indeed, yeah. I don't know, Clint, Liliana, if you want to add anything, but there are some questions here that I can move toward. All right, we've got one question. Um, super curious to hear the three of you discuss your relationship to your audience. Ken, do you stay connected to your work or its reception in any way after it's unveiled? Same with Liliana and Clint, what happens after opening night? How do you stay in relationship with those receiving what you've made or do you intentionally step away? I can go first super quick. Uh, so, because art is a, is an un, you know is a, is a is a thing. It relives in every different time it's shown and sort of has different manifestations. And otherwise, basically the internet. So people write me all the time, and I also teach. So there's a way in which that I'm in conversation about the issues and ideas of the work every day um, at different levels. For the billboard, when we did the bill, billboard you saw, we had a website link, and people. Uh, actually, believe it or not, did did follow up. Not everybody, but uh, they they estimated that six million people saw it, and then um, you know driving by doesn't mean that they they thought about it, but they saw it, and and some people stopped and wrote down that address and sent an email. So we we tried a, a bunch of different ways to think about how to how do you measure public art? How do you know if it's working? How do you know if it's doing what it's supposed to do? And uh, so anyway, that's I think in the arts how how uh, I've approached it. Yeah, there's this strange, crazy moment as a director where you realize like that 
you got to go. <laughs> that you nothing like you got to leave and it's it's crazy because it's like you reach a certain part in performance where you realize you've set the intentions and the movement and the and the cadence and the 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 design and it all you know you've built the story but it's breathes life every day anew in the performances and in some ways that's like the gift of amazing actors is continuing to find the life and the newness with each performance even after um, the director and the design team um, has had to depart um, but for me that's a, but the ephemera of theater, the fact that it will end, the fact that it doesn't live forever is I think also what's so special about it and makes it kind of the part of the living conversation with whoever kind of enters into the theater in that moment because it'll never be exactly the same. You know what I mean? It, it has its bones, it will it will be the story that is the story, but each, each day there's a new group of people that you're seeing it with, you know what I mean? There's a, there's a, an actor comes in <laughs> and is having the day that they're having and that fuels or, you know what I mean? They have to work against in some ways, whatever that is. And I think that's, um, that's really special. Yeah, I would agree with, with Liliana. I think for me personally, I actually, I, I like to leave before, um, <laughs> I, I, let me rephrase that. I am I, so afraid of its death, right? I'm so afraid of its end that I protect myself from that, right? And But I know that actually, like I, my, my, my job is that I have a tendency to linger and watch like, you know, forever. But I, I, there, is, there is a point where you, you, you leave it and you, you, you've served it up, you leave it. And so that's why like, you know, things like reviews are very disturbing, right? Because it is, it is antithetical to that leave taking, you know. It is antithetical to 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 you having gone through the spiritual journey of actually giving something away, um, because it tries to bring you back in, you know, and tries to bring you back in not on your own terms, right, but like on somebody else's terms. And so, I, I, I anyway, we can talk about reviews later. But I also I think what's fascinating is like even with this talk, what I what I love is this idea of as, as Liliana said, this ephemera, right? And so when you say, oh gosh, like remember when you did that thing in 2014 or whatever, whatever, you're actually encountering a memory, right? You're not encountering the piece itself, but you're encountering a memory and someone else's memory. And I think that's so cool. I think that there is a life that existed in 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 somebody's um, somebody's uh, 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 mind and somebody's spirit that you know they've been carrying until they encountered you, you know. Uh, and I think that's so cool. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, this last question, I feel like we've uh, touched on a little bit throughout the conversation, but I'm I'm curious how you'd all respond to, to this particular question, which is, is sculpture theatrical, is theater sculptural, and what might these forms have to learn from what each other? That's a great question, of course. <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> I think what they have to learn from each other is really what this is maybe the for me at least the first conversation where I get to have that right where I think about so I've never really thought about the theater side of it beyond as a metaphor or beyond as something I imagined I was staging these and that they would be a dialogue with an audience and so I imagine many of the things that go with theater but I uh, I never literally thought of it as being theater uh, and now having it on a theater where people walk up and look at it and read a text uh, there, there literally is uh, a different aspect to it, which is, I guess, environmental or uh, interactive. And it will be like any theater piece. It'll only be up for that amount of time and people will see it for that day and maybe it's whatever. So uh, so I'm really interested to, to think more about those overlaps between the, the theatrical and the, the, the artistic or visual. 
Yeah, just gonna say yes to that. Also, guys, not gonna lie, I feel like I have to fight a lot, and I don't know why this is my personal feeling. Sometimes I don't think people appreciate theater as a visual art sometimes. I'm just so grateful, Natasha, for bringing this um, conversation together because it's nice to be in conversation with other art forms because I feel there's so much potential um, inside of that, and I think what theater can learn is to to be even more rigorous <laughs> in its stagings, you know what I mean? And in, in its awareness of the power of the image and how an audience might read it if we actually allowed it to sit, you know? So that's really interesting question. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that I think if if sculpt uh, if uh, if sculpture can teach theater something, really, it is it, it is for me, you know, um, it can teach theater its own power, right? Um, um, and, and uh, um, uh, it, it, you know, the sort of the economy of power, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I, and, and, and I think in the theater, sometimes we don't trust, you know, that one thing that we've, you know that we're able to bring, and 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 sort of the wholeness of that one thing, you know, is enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. First of all, yes, Liliana and Clint, I too, I just I love that we have this public art series for those reasons. Theater doesn't exist in a vacuum. The whole point is that it's within the world and responding and engaging with the world. And to have Ken's piece prompt, you know, all of these conversations and and thoughts is is so special. Um, thank you, Ken, for, for profiled and, and all your other work that I feel yeah. like I've been digging into for, for a while now. Um, you know, you're really, you're bringing to the forefront the, the sort of workings like behind how we're made to perceive things. And profiled is so powerful because you're, you're like naming those forces and then we're able to wrestle with them and, and really talk about them in all these different ways. Um, it's just, it's really powerful. So thank you for giving us so much to, to think about. Um, in the world and and when we are able to sit in theaters again, I feel like these are these are conversations I'll I'll remember. Uh, so thank you so much and thanks so much to two giants of our theater community, Liliana and Clint. Thank you for making time to be here today. Um, and so just just to close out, this is you know just for our audience watching, this is our third event in our Lighthouse Talk series, which has so far been discussion discussion uh, revolving around our public art series, the two installations we've had so far. Um, you can watch the past talks in full on YouTube, and we hope you visit Playwrights Horizons on 42nd Street to see Ken's work now um, and engage with that. It just went up, and we want to hear what you think. So, you know, tag us when you take pictures and talk about it, um, and stay tuned for more from Lighthouse. So far, uh, these discussions, these Lighthouse talks have been about just this, but it'll be about a lot more, including more um, about public art in the future. Uh, and lastly, these are, you know, incredibly trying times for everyone, psychologically, emotionally, but if you're in a space to give to us as we offer more opportunities to gauge with the world around us via theater and art, please text Lighthouse PH to 44321, uh, or you can just visit phnyc.org slash donate. Uh, so thank you so much to all, to, you know, the three of you, as well as everyone watching, thank you for joining us and take care.